Well, hello, everyone. I'm James Dobson, and you're listening to Family Talk, a listener-supported ministry. In fact, thank you so much for being part of that support for James Dobson Family Institute. Hello, and thanks for listening to Family Talk. Family Talk is the radio home of Dr. James Dobson, America's preeminent Christian child psychologist and a leading voice defending traditional family values and righteousness in the culture. I'm Roger Marsh. So glad you found us today. While you don't have to look very hard at our nation's history and legacy to find the influence of God in Christianity, in fact, many of our founding fathers were outspoken in their belief that without morality and virtue, liberty and human rights would be impossible for a nation to obtain. Our guest on today's classic broadcast agrees with that point of view. His name is Newt Gingrich. Newt Gingrich is a politician and an author who served as the 50th Speaker of the United States House of Representatives from 1995 to 1999. He is a Fox News contributor, podcast host, and chairman of Gingrich 360, a multimedia production and consulting company based in Arlington, Virginia. He and his wife, Callista, live in McLean, Virginia, and have two daughters and two grandchildren. Newt Gingrich joined Dr. Dobson back in 2007 to discuss his book, Rediscovering God in America, Reflections on the Role of Faith in Our Nation's History and Future. Here now is Dr. James Dobson to introduce his special guest. Uh, We're going to place a phone call to the former Speaker of the House of Representatives, Newt Gingrich, uh, to talk about his book, Rediscovering God in America. Uh, I have known uh, Mr. Gingrich for 12 or 13 years. I worked with him uh, quite extensively when he was Speaker of the House. Uh, We often talked about teaching abstinence to young people and the pro-family and pro-life issues that we care about so deeply. And uh, so I was in his office uh, off and on during that time. Um, He uh, has a remarkable grasp of the culture. He has a Ph.D. in European history and in uh, an understanding of world events, and it shows in what he says. Uh, Newt Gingrich was elected to the Congress in 1978. Uh, He was Time Magazine's Man of the Year in 1995, uh, the same year that he was elected to be Speaker of the House. Hello, Mr. Speaker. It is great to be with you. And it's a pleasure to have you uh, on our program. I appreciate your joining us, and we want to talk about the subjects that are of interest uh, to our faith and to the country uh, today. And I'd like to start by talking about uh, your book, Rediscovering God in America, Reflections of the Role of Faith in Our Nation's History and Future. I I think this is the first time you've addressed a topic of that nature, isn't it? Well, it's the first time I've written about it at length. I, I, for a long time, have had a part of my basic speech which talks about the fact that we are endowed by our Creator with certain inalienable rights, and that that's what the Declaration of Independence says, and you can see it right there at the National Archive. But when the Ninth Circuit Court ruled that the saying one nation under God in the Pledge of Allegiance was wrong, uh, that to me was a final blow in the secular war against the religious basis of American liberty. And that's why I decided I had to write Rediscovering God in America as a historian to lay out the historic facts and to illustrate them by using the monuments that people can see in Washington so that it's not a question of theory or it's not a question of somebody's ideology. It is a fact. It is a fact that the Declaration of Independence says we are endowed by our Creator. And I I wanted to really have have a very small but very fact-based introduction so that if you have a secular friend who doesn't believe all this, you can just just hand them that small volume uh, or give them the audio tape, and, and you'll see that it's, it's irrefutable historically. We can't rediscover something that isn't lost. Have we lost that historic understanding of God in the country? I think the American elites, starting with the Supreme Court decision in 1963 on school prayer, have been engaged in a relentless effort to secularize the society, 
to drive God out of public life, to drive uh, the Thanksgiving out of Thanksgiving, to drive the Christmas out of Christmas, to create a secular America on the European model. And it's an expression of the radicalism of the French Revolution, which was an anti-church revolution, uh, basically violating uh, all of previous Western uh, traditions, yeah. and very different from the American uh tradition, which was just, you know, the American Revolution was a revolution within the context of the Scottish Enlightenment, which was very respectful of the role of God and very respectful of the importance of seeking guidance from God. The French Revolution was quite the opposite, and I think that the American secular elites are really shaped much more by that French experience than they are by the American experience. You wrote in the uh, introduction to that book that the secular left has been inventing law and grotesquely distorting the Constitution to achieve a goal that the Founding Fathers would have found to be a fundamental threat to liberty. Uh, That's a quote. Expand on that. Well, let me say that the Founding Fathers, starting with George Washington, were very direct about this, and this includes Thomas Jefferson. Uh, All of them believed that freedom was cultural first and legal and political second, and that if you did not have a culture that subordinated itself to God, and you didn't have a culture that recognized that our rights come from God, that in the long run you couldn't preserve freedom in a purely secular society. And, and, their, and their writing is very clear on this. This is not some contrivance or some confusion. My favorite example is the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court opens every session with God save this court and the United States of America. Every session. The Supreme Court has on the building, including when you first walk in, Moses holding the Ten Commandments. It appears three times in the Supreme Court building. How can a Supreme Court justice vote that it is unconstitutional for Texas or Kentucky or Alabama to display the Ten Commandments when the very building they're meeting in, a building, by the way, built in the 1930s, this is not some throwback to 1800, the very building they're meeting in uh, has the Ten Commandments. And and so I think it's it's that level of willful rejection of American history and, and the base of American civilization that is such an enormous threat to us. Why do you think the liberals hate our religious heritage so much and those of us who identify with it? And uh, and what would they replace it with if they're successful? Well, look. <laughs> I, I, I apologize if I sound slightly exasperated just because you and I have both been engaged in this struggle for so long. That's true. And, it's, and what I'm about to say is so politically incorrect. The modern American left, uh, the, the tenured faculty, many of the newsrooms, uh, many of the judges, the, the elites, the Hollywood elite, they want a world in which there are no rules, there are no principles. Uh, in which people can reshape whatever they want, in which political correctness allows you to avoid uh, hard edges. Uh, And and that's a world which, frankly, I believe is incompatible with human freedom and incompatible with human happiness. But it's at the very heart of it. The the whole notion that that there shouldn't be boundaries, uh, that there shouldn't be any sense of you having an outside set of rules that you look to, you know, Part of our cultural struggle, the reason some of our politics is now so bitter and so hostile, is that you have these two cultures, the the dominant culture of the vast majority of Americans, the 91% who believe we should say one nation under God is part of the pledge, and a very small but extraordinarily powerful minority on the campuses, in the law courts, in the newsrooms, and in Hollywood, who desperately want to have a different world. Well, you mentioned the Ninth Circuit a minute ago, which is the court that struck down or tried to strike down that phrase, one nation under God, in the Pledge of Allegiance. Ninety-one percent of the people support it, yet they arrogantly uh, tried to get rid of it. You've said, I, I heard you the last time we were together, about two or three weeks ago, that uh, you thought the Ninth Circuit should be abolished. Well, you know, I learned this by studying Thomas Jefferson, and it's quite ironic because 
Uh, secular leftist will tell you that Jefferson wrote the phrase, uh, a wall of separation between church and state, and they've used it to drive prayer out of public school, to drive the Ten Commandments out of public buildings. They would use it to, over and over again. I suspect in the end they would use it to stop the president from taking an oath of allegiance on a Bible. That is a total misreading of Jefferson. Uh, first of all, when Jefferson wrote the letter to the uh, Danbury Baptist, what he meant was we should not have a state-sponsored, tax-paid religion. Well, I think you and I would both agree with that. Absolutely. We don't want to see the Church of the United States. But Jefferson, two days after uh, that particular letter, got in his carriage at the White House, rode up one mile to Capitol Hill, and went to church in the U.S. House of Representatives Chamber, which was used as a church till the 1860s. Jefferson loaned the Treasury Building to be used as a church. Jefferson paid tax money for missionaries to the Indians. So I'm giving you this background because many people will be very startled by what I'm about to tell them. The Jeffersonians were in a deep argument with the Federalists, and uh, the last time prior to the McCain-Feingold bill that there was an effort to censor American citizens and block them from talking openly about politics was the Alien and Sedition Acts. And when the Jeffersonians won a huge election in 1800, elected a big majority in the House and Senate, the last thing the Federalists did is they tried to pack the courts by appointing lots and lots of Federalists to the court just before turning power over to the, the newly victorious, uh, what was called the Republican Democratic Party back then. The Jeffersonians passed the Reform Act, the Judicial Reform Act of 1802. They abolished 18 out of 35 federal judgeships. And I want our listeners to really understand this. The Jeffersonians, people who had helped write the Constitution, Jefferson, who had written the Declaration of Independence, people who thoroughly understood the rules of, of, of the three branches of government, believed that the Congress and the President could quite simply abolish a court. You don't have to impeach the judge as an individual. You simply say, this court no longer meets. And that's what they said. So my position would be that uh, the Ninth Circuit Court is so consistently wrong, it is so consistently radical, it is such a violation of the spirit of American history that we are better off to simply abolish it. And now, I'm, I'm not being as radical as Thomas Jefferson. He wiped out over 50 percent of all sitting federal judges. I just want to take one circuit court, the Ninth, eliminate it, create a new Ninth Circuit, and have uh, the appointment of new judges to that new Ninth Circuit. If that sounds like an overstatement, statement to our listeners who haven't been following the uh, rulings of the Ninth Circuit. Uh, let me give one example of it, one of the most egregious uh, decisions that it's handed down. The Ninth Circuit ruled, uh, yeah, just look this up, November the 2nd, 2005, that public school officials have the authority to operate completely independently of parents and that the curriculum and everything else related to the school, not just the curriculum, is the school's business exclusively and moms and dads can do nothing to change it or to influence it. That's the decision of the Ninth Circuit. They completely cut the parents out of the education of their children. That's the kind of stuff this crazy court does, isn't it? It is. This would be a perfectly reasonable court in France. It makes no sense as a court in the United States. Huh. Well, let's take your book and go on a walking tour of Washington, D.C., uh, because uh, your position is that those buildings that are there and what's inscribed on them uh, really does uh, tell a story about our religious history. And uh, one of the uh, best chapters in your book, I think, is entitled Laos Deo, uh, which appears, I think, on the top of the Washington Monument. You know, it's really a very romantic story in a way. The, the tallest point in Washington by law is the Washington Monument. It's, it's higher than the Capitol. No office building in Washington can be as high. And if you think about it, the first thing the rays of the sun hit every morning, the very first thing that is lit up in Washington is the east side of the Washington Monument. And on the very top of the east side, it says Laos Deo, glory to God. And, and the fact is that the Washington Monument is a monument to God and to Washington's belief. As Washington said in, in, in a letter, and, and something he had said, said a number of occasions publicly, he believed at the depths of his being that when the American army was trapped in Brooklyn, 
and the British Army was going to crush it, and the Royal Navy was between the American Army uh, and Manhattan and, and was, was blocking the East River, that at that moment, uh, the war was at the edge of just being ended. In a magic moment, uh, we found out that a fog rolls in. We're suddenly not in a position for the British to intercede. And the Americans quietly escape through the fog. The Marblehead fishermen, who later will play such a key role in, in the surprise of Christmas Day, row them across the river. They escape the British. And Washington said literally, as that fog rolled in, magically blocking the British fleet from being able to see what was going on, he felt as though God had decided that the American Revolution should not be defeated. Now, the Washington Monument is a reflection of that depth of personal commitment. And uh, by the way, I must say that, that any of our listeners who get a chance, there is a new education center at Mount Vernon, uh, Magic Center, which, which will teach you more in an afternoon about George Washington and about the magic of America than any place I have ever seen. Uh -huh. So I just give this as background because the Washington Monument has a Bible in the foundation stone. It has actually prayers and Bible verses put in by a Chinese church in Baltimore. Uh, it has reference after reference to the scripture. Uh, and, it, and it's really quite different than the, the, the secular folks would try to tell you. And you can't understand this. And I, I would say to all of our listeners also, if you do get a chance to bring your family to Washington, you can download the audio version of Rediscovering God, and you can literally take your family around and go, go monument by monument and public building by public building and learn of all of the various relationships uh, between God and American leaders up through, by the way, the modern era. This is not just something back in the revolutionary period. Franklin Delano Roosevelt, when the American forces landed at Normandy, went on radio, which was their version of television in that period, and led the nation for nine minutes in a prayer. Mm -hmm. The president didn't just say, God bless America. He prayed for nine minutes because he thought it was his job as the spiritual leader of America, as the father of America, as the person picked to lead the American community, that it was his job to bring all of us together at this historic moment when so many young Americans were risking their lives. For those listeners who joined us late, we're talking to former Speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives, uh, Newt Gingrich, about uh, his book, Rediscovering God in America. And uh, it's a very inspirational book uh, containing the kind of information we just heard about. Uh, I want to say, Mr. Speaker, what a shame, what an outrage it is that America's schoolchildren are not taught uh, history in any meaningful way. They're so busy teaching a lot of the junk, uh, and this is the source of our liberty. And uh, even if it is taught, uh, then the concepts are often uh, distorted and emphasize our faults and our failures and our fiascos, and uh, certainly uh, nothing about our religious history. Well, and, you know, the, the fascinating thing is that our religious history is our political history. Uh, for example, as I'm, as I'm sure you know, the Liberty Bell uh, is called the Liberty Bell because not long before it was used to ring out liberty on July 4th, 1776, it was called the Liberty Bell because it has around the top of it a quote from Leviticus uh, about letting liberty ring across the land. You know, you, you cannot explain America. And then this is my core argument with our secular friends. You can't explain America uh, without understanding this. I have a good friend who, to give you a parallel example, uh, a senior leader in the Reagan administration, a man who ended up having deep trouble with alcohol, finally went to Alcoholics Anonymous, changed his life, dramatically gave him a meaning, gave him support, allowed him to recover. And several years later was explaining this to a senior federal official who said, you know, that is a terrific program. And it's a 12-step program, and the first step says you have to subordinate yourself and acknowledge that there is one greater than you and that in the end you are dependent on that one. You're not an individual who's on your own. And uh, the federal official said, you know, if you could skip that first step, we could fund the other 11. Uh. 
And he said, yeah. and he looked at the guy and said, I don't think you understand what it is that makes this work. Well, I would say that about America. If you take away the Declaration of Independence, and we grow up two or three generations in a row that do not understand that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, among which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, not the achievement. Our time is getting away from us. Let me ask you for some uh, very quick numbers, okay? okay? How many times is God mentioned in one form or another in the Declaration of Independence? I think it appears uh, five or six times both as creator, as supreme being, uh, as the law of nature and nature's God. Yeah. Uh, how many times is God uh, referred to in the Jefferson Memorial? There are four different quotes, all of which quote, cite God, of which uh, I think the most powerful is, uh, I have sworn upon the altar of God eternal hostility against all forms of tyranny over the minds of man. And I think I always tell my secular friends, tell me what you think Jefferson meant, altar of God. Hmm. Well, uh, we get a very different interpretation from Barry Lynn and the uh, Americans United for the Separation of Church and State. How about uh, Lincoln's two inaugural speeches as they show up in the monument? In the Lincoln Memorial, you get, uh, first of all, the, the Gettysburg Address, which is where the term One Nation Under God uh, appears. And, ju and we know that Lincoln personally hand-wrote that into his speech while sitting looking out over the cemetery during the ceremonies to uh, inaugurate and consecrate the very first national cemetery at Gettysburg. And, and, and it said One Nation, and then he hand-wrote Under God as he thought about and reflected uh, on what he was experiencing there looking out over these graves of those who had died to preserve the Union. Didn't Lincoln uh, also say in his second inaugural, with malice toward none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right, as God gives us to see the right? That's exactly right. Yeah, uh, I think... Now, the other, and in, in, in the most touching, and I think most profound of all the inaugural addresses, in the second inaugural by Lincoln in 1865, in 703 words... He references God 14 times, uh. and he quotes the Bible twice. Now, how are you going to explain Lincoln, and how are you going to explain the preservation of the Union? If you refuse, and, and you know, if you were to go into a typical history a classroom of almost any public school in America and say, let me read you this perfectly secular speech. This, this is an inaugural address by a president of the United States, not a theological yeah. document. Now explain to me what you think these 14 references to God mean. What do you think these two quotes from the Bible mean? And I, that's why it, it, it is impossible to describe and explain America if you insist on doing it in purely secular terms. You said that it is impossible to walk through the National Archive building in Washington without finding God. That is exactly right. And it's impossible to walk through the Supreme Court. And it's impossible to walk through the, the U.S. Capitol. That's why we did Rediscovering God in America the way we did. This is a tour book. And when you take, take your most radical secular friend, get him to go to Washington with you, walk through the city, and at the end of that tour, look him in the eye and say, you know, what country do you think this is in? Mr. Speaker, we're out of time. I just want to thank you for being our guest. I appreciate this book. I appreciate uh, your setting the record straight on something that's extremely important to us and to uh, millions of people with a very strong Christian faith across this country. And uh, I do look forward to talking to you again. For the benefit of those, again, who joined us late, we've been talking to former Speaker of the House, uh, Newt Gingrich about his book, Rediscovering God in America. Psalm 127 verse 1 says, Unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the guards stand watch in vain. Here at Family Talk, we believe that the Lord has blessed the United States in many ways because of its Christian heritage. Over the past several decades, though, we have seen God's blessing being lifted from our nation as a direct result of America rejecting biblical values and turning its back on God. 
Now, we are not so arrogant as to say that the U.S. is God's chosen nation. In fact, we know that this is not the case, as that title belongs to the nation of Israel. However, the Lord has used America to bless countless nations all over the world, and it's important for us to remember our Christian heritage so that we can defend those values that made America great in the first place. Well, Newt Gingrich's book, Rediscovering God in America, which was the focus of today's broadcast, is still available for purchase. We have a link to that resource, as well as the audiobook version, at drjamesdobson.org forward slash broadcast. That's drjamesdobson.org forward slash broadcast. And while you're there, you can learn more about Newt Gingrich and his other books as well. Now, if you enjoyed today's broadcast or if you have a prayer need, won't you give us a call and let us know about it? Our ministry team is available around the clock to answer your calls, to pray with you, and to recommend helpful resources as well. Our number is 877-732-6825. That's 877-732-6825. Thanks again for joining us for today's edition of Family Talk. Catch us again next time as we provide encouragement and advice for the fruitful Christian life. This has been a presentation of the Dr. James Dobson Family Institute.